we just finished the G20 meeting in Brazil in which President Joe Biden missed out on the family photo and got lost in the Amazon rainforest. Today, I want to anchor our discussion on the new Chinese deep sea seaport in Peru, Chiang Kai port. And I would like to use this as an opportunity to talk a little bit about South America in general, and also how this uh, deep sea, new deep sea seaport uh, in Peru affect China US strategic competition on a global level, and also uh, use it to forecast uh, future economic development in Latin America. First, let's watch a short introduction video about this seaport. The newest gateway to Asia is this megaport just north of the Peruvian capital, Lima. It's also built by China, which is likely to be the largest benefactor of the port, receiving goods from South American countries like Brazil. Shipping companies say the Peruvian port will be mutually beneficial. Brazil, eh, normalmente sus rutas son o por el canal de Panamá o por el Cabo de Horno por, por el África. Y eso, más allá de que dependiendo de dónde está tu centro de, de producción, Brasil es inmenso, contra más cerca al Perú, va a ser mucho más, más fácil llegar al Pacífico, que no son más de 3, 4 días, vía terrestre. De ahí le sumas 22 días de travesía y podrías estar en menos de 30 días en el Asia. Once the Chinese built port is completed, companies will be able to travel from Chaque, Peru to Asia in 30 days. That's 15 days faster than today's traditional routes through the Panama Canal or the Cabo de Hornos. Let me show you guys a map here, and I'm going to use this map as a reference today. All right. Now, the United States of America is running a global empire. All right. And one of the key features of this global empire is to control the global trade system. Okay. I don't want to go super deep into this. I, I talked about it in other video, and I will emphasize it again in future video. But maybe people can imagine it as some kind of a British Commonwealth system, all right, enhanced by modern technology. In China, we have a few of those uh, patriotic economists and politicians who voice our opinions about China's growth over the past few decades and how China often struggle between growing its economy, which means working closely with the United States and obeying the Western led international rules and regulations, which often favors the Western countries. And how at the same time, we can avoid turning ourselves, meaning China, into Latin America. <laughs> and I think this description is understood by many intellectuals in Latin America, because they understand that they are in somewhat of a semi colonial status right now. I think I mentioned this before, but my European audience have no idea what I'm talking about. So I want to summarize this into just one sentence, okay? is that the financial, political, ideological, military power projection, and often to say covert operation as well, the United States over the centuries has turned most of the Central and Latin America into a form of colony, all right? In which that you either choose to be subordinate to the United States and let the United States modify your country in a way that favors the United States, or you will risk isolation, containment, and embargo like Cuba and Venezuela. So you either obey the gringos or you know risk global isolation. So if you look at Latin America countries, 
Although there's no major war over the last century, uh, its involvement in World War One and World War Two is very limited, almost non-existent, uh, from my understanding. Its economy is kind of stuck in a debt cycle, okay? And standard of living didn't really improve that much over the years compared to, let's say, China and other Southeast Asian countries, which start off really late compared to South America. I think there's a famous quote from Argentina, which says that um, if you leave the country for 10 days and come back, everything changed. But... If you leave the country for 10 years and come back, nothing changed. <laughs> I have explained in one of my earlier video that through financial and monetary manipulation and also control of trade route, basically digital and physical control at the same time of the trade system. All right. United States were able to both suppress and tax the Latin America economy in favor of itself. Uh, but this new Peru port changed some of that U.S. imperial architect that has been placed over the Latin American country. First of all, okay, at the moment, there's no deep sea port. Well, this is the first deep sea port on the western coast of South America. In order to trade effectively with Asia, you need to use those huge ocean crossing freight, uh, freighters, okay? So in order to trade with country like China, uh, the ship need to haul its containers, the smaller ship, to haul those containers into a larger port, such as uh, the port here in Los Angeles, which I'm living in right now, or use uh, one of those larger port on the eastern side of the continent um, to put on larger ships, which you can cross the ocean effectively and cost efficiently into China and trade with China. In other words, you can trade with Asia uh, effectively from South America without going through Americans first. <laughs> That's basically it. Let me put this into perspective, okay? Um, to trade with Asia, you have to use the US or Western led financial system to conduct the trade, all right? You have to use US dollar <laughs> to conduct the trade because. Uh, someone like George Soros will keep attacking your local currency to make it too weak on the international stage. You have to use U.S. port because you don't have your own port. And maybe U.S. is also putting, you know, uh, let's say discourage you from building your own port. Uh, you don't have the funding for it. You have to also use U.S. shipping companies probably as well. And then you have to also go through um, Western US led uh, insurance company to secure your trade or else that would be, you know, illegal in some way. So basically you can tell in order to trade with China and other Asian countries, uh, you have to go, go through Uncle Sam. And if let's say there's a $10 profit in the trade, Uncle Sam have to take $9 out of it first. Maybe that's a little bit exaggeration, but if you think about it, from South America, it's mainly minerals and agriculture products, right? And they are not really this kind of high value gain products to begin with. And when you have United States, you know, taxing the trade through so many different ways, the profit margin is significantly reduced, right? This is what I have been saying for a long time. In order for Latin American countries to improve their standard of living, and this uh, is the same for many global South countries as well, you need to build an economic and trade model that allows you to retain as much of the trade profit as possible. So you cannot let other countries to tax your trade because you need those things to, you know, build up your own infrastructures and build up your own social security system and all those things, education, healthcare, and so on. So you need to climb that food chain, right? And you can't do that when Uncle Sam is always control and manipulating and monopolizing all those uh, trade activities. And I haven't even get to the financial commodity derivative and options, which is another way to tax the products and labor value in those developing South countries. 
So if you jump out of Latin America and look at the global competition between China and US, the United States over the years have transformed its economic model from mainly production to running like a global financial empire, which controls trade, okay, through different uh, methods. So instead of producing and manufacturing many of the things and trade with the rest of the world, it has turned the US business model into something like a taxation model on the global economy through the dollar system and use that to cover its over domestic expenditure. That's what's going on right now. But over time, this texting model, the operators in mainly Wall Street became, I would say, too greedy. All right. And with the system, it start to extract too much value on the transitions between countries and creating this kind of economic bubbles and then bursting the economic bubbles and printing mass amount of dollars to rescue the problems and dump and transfer that cost onto the rest of the planet. So through this system, you are basically taking the profit margin and value out of many global South country. And US has been doing that more frequently and with a much higher intensity. And that create a lot of problems in the global South countries. Many countries went bankrupt, uh, especially the new economy, which is undergoing development at a very fast pace. They're more fragile, right? Forcing countries to right now seek alternative. So this is where China comes in, okay? With this new deep sea port. What you're looking at is not just a two week reduction in transit time uh, in logistic trade, but China is also removing, I would say, the pillows, okay, of this new colonial architecture of the West, the United States mainly, that has imposed on Latin America over the century to provide this kind of alternative to South American countries. Uh, so China and other Asian countries can trade with South America without Uncle Sam being the greedy middleman taxing every trade and transactions. And I have talked about uh, what sovereignty is in other videos. Uh, I have also made example of country in, let's say, Africa who is in a state of landlock, okay? They do not have direct access to ocean and to trade. And whatever country they export and import to and from have to go through another country, right? So those country can never be fully sovereign because his neighbor who has access to open ocean can often influence their political decision. Um, okay, so let me make an example here, okay? So if you imagine I am an African country, landlock another African country, and both of us have the same mineral reserve for exporting, why would I let your mineral go through my railroad or road system and my seaport when your export is basically competing with mine, right? Unless you will you know, give me a huge fat cut of your profit. I'm just not going to let you through. And because every dollar of profit you make is competing with mine. So that gives me a huge political and economic leverage over that country that I'm basically landlocking into. And this is what really happened in South America as well. <laughs> and if you look at, you know, uh, on the western side, there's no deep sea port, so you cannot harbor those large ocean going freighters. Uh, to trade with Asia, you have to go through the Americans. So whether it's going through here in Los Angeles and then traveling to uh, Asia, or you have to kind of use the East Coast port first and then go through, you know, the Panama Canal and then get your products through. That's gonna cost. A lot extra on the products that really do not have that much of a high value gain to begin with. So it's the same way when you look at this. You are basically landlocked because you don't have that deep ocean going freighter. And through that, you have 
kind of surrender part of your profit and also part of your political sovereignty to United States in order to gain that trade route access, right? But now with this new Chinese seaport, you have an alternative. China actually did the same thing to Cambodia in Southeast Asia, which made the Vietnamese kind of mad. Okay, what happened is that because Cambodia, although having direct uh, access to ocean, its internal river, I think it's the the Mekong River, the exit have to go through Vietnam. So in order to haul its good effectively, cost efficiently into the ocean and into the international market, it has to go through Vietnam and then, you know, put on those larger ship and then go elsewhere. This gave the Vietnamese government uh, political leverage, economic leverage over Cambodia and also Laos, which Laos is a landlocked country inside Cambodia and um, Vietnam. Because those countries do not have direct access to a seaport as easily as uh, Vietnam. But what China did is that China built a canal in Cambodia, which allowed Cambodians to directly go through and into the ocean without going through Vietnam, which this will alternatively gave Cambodia more sovereignty over its neighbor Vietnam which Vietnamese wasn't too happy. I understand that. But this is what China is doing, not just in South America, but around the world as well. Now, this is very different from the United States model or let's say collective West models over the centuries, which is to me has this colonial mentality or interference and control on the rest of the global South. China is currently actually helping many of the countries to achieve higher degree of freedom by, I will say, um, unshackling okay, them from this colon colonial handcuff, uh, a different approach. And this is happening in not just this, this particular sector, but in many other sectors as well. Now, I would say that, yes, this is going to be a huge problem for the United States uh, into the future because it's not just this one port. China is also planning another port. I forgot in which country, but this time in uh, Central America, this port is basically already uh, finished its construction and it's open for business. That new port, I believe is maybe it's in Mexico, is doing basically the same thing to to allow this country to kind of circumvent and avoid dealing directly with a uh, united state and can deal with the rest of the world directly so for the united states which is kind of raging a trade war against china right and it's forbidden to sell let's say high technology products to china and i, I understand south americans cannot help china on high tech but what it can help China with is with uh, agriculture products. We need a lot of those because US, after banning those uh, high tech products, have to rely more on its own agriculture products to balance the trade deflect with China, right? And South America agriculture, uh, agriculture products is one of the biggest competitor to United States. So now China can basically say that, okay, if you are not going to sell us those events, uh, semiconductors chips, we will have to develop our own. And you know what? Uh, we're not going to buy your soil bean neither. Okay. We're going to buy from the Brazilians and other South American countries because you're being mean to me. <laughs> I have people who keep asking me to make a video about South China Sea, what's going on there. I think I tried, but there's really not that many material in there to begin with. And if you understand how colonialism and how neocolonialism work, it's the same thing, basically why uh, United States want to stir up problems in South China Sea, also why it wants Ukraine and why it wants Crimea so badly uh, from the Russians and why you keep trying to regime change. Turkey is the same thing. If you understand how the neocolonial system work, you will have all your questions answered. Basically, it is to control and contain states that they do not have control over. That's basically it. 
And this is a huge problem for the U.S. empire. And I mean, think about it. What does an empire afraid the most is when you know its colonies start to ignore the emperor and start trading among themselves. You start to lose the capability to tax these colonies on trade, and that will put more pressure on the fiscal. Uh, planning of United States, right? And this is what China is pushing forward with. Now, that being said, however, I'm not sure about the long run. Uh, my friends in South America have to tell me and, you know, see what you think. I'm not sure because um, when this kind of thing continues and really start to piss off uh, the United States, the three letter agencies will probably start a new run of regime change operation to reverse uh, the momentum, right? And the US political influence over Latin America political system is very strong and very cruel, I dare to say. So can those trade between China and Latin America, you know, trade between Brazil and China increased, I think, close to 20 fold, if not something like 16, 17 fold over the past 20 years. But can those trade really, you know, benefit the people in Latin America? That is actually uncertain, I would say, because the prosperity of Latin American um, people also depends on how well you guys can defend and resist against U.S. influence. Um, that's something China might not be able to assist that much. So you have to find your own way to build like financial and also political barrier. So uh, Americans will not be jumping into your government every other year to regime change you and, you know, enforce policy that will damage and limit your growth. And, you know, kind of waste the opportunity that you have trading with China. So that's something even many Chinese politicians are currently not sure of. Well, that's the video for today. Let me know in the comment section what you think, okay?